That's a great start. Hi, my name is Sydney Levine, and I'm here to talk about evil women. Bum bum bum. Um, so I pretty much found this book that my stepdad gave my mother, and I began reading it, and I was like, I have to share this with people because I want to share solely the women's side of murdering and serial killers and stuff um because i feel like it's not talked about as much as the male uh, serial killers and just murderers murderers fuck my life murderers in general so i'm in my jammies i'm all cozy and cuddled up in my room and i'm gonna tell you about jane andrews okay if you want to listen if you don't that's okay you can click off i understand anyways Jane was born in 1967 in, um, I can't pronounce it, but Cleothorpe's Northeast Lincolnshire. So that's in England, I believe. So she was the youngest of three and her family struggled. Like I'm talking about struggled financially. Like her father was a carpenter, but he couldn't get full-time work. And her mother worked too. It said as a social worker, um, but I don't really know much about it. It didn't go into detail. So, <clears throat> pardon me. Ahem. So, because they're, they're, so it was really unconventional for both parents to be working, but they financially just had to. And eventually it got to the point where they had to move the fuck out of their home. Yeah, like their home that she grew up in, um, I think she was eight years old when they moved out. So they moved out and were trying to save money that way and went to like a smaller home in Grimsby. Hold on, let me see. It says, uh, I want to make sure I get it pronounced right just for respect for those people that are living there. Um, Grimsby, I think. So anyway, so even though they did like reduced their size of home and sold their other home they financially just could not get ahead okay and this caused as in most households that are financially stressed a lot of tension and a lot of anger so they fought a lot and jane witnessed this and one time her mom even asked the children to go around the house and find uh any loose change so that they could get a loaf of bread a loaf of bread was hard to obtain to this family. So this affected her a lot and as rightfully it should. And then, so she always got good grades, but it, she, they said that she wasn't considered a stereotypical student. Um, so when she was 15, she got in trouble with truancy, which if you don't know what that is, cause you're a good kid and you don't skip school, yo. So I'm so dumb. So anyways, if you don't know what truancy is, it's when you skip school to the point where officials have to get involved. And this incident, I don't know if it caused her to try to commit suicide or if it was just she tried to commit suicide after that. But after the truancy issue, she went around the house and took all the co like cocktail ball, the pills that she could find because she was so depressed and so stressed and just wanted to escape. And her mother knew like her mother caught on and then even though she caught on she didn't call the fucking police ambulance nothing she just left her to deal with it hopefully you don't die like what the fuck so um jane ended up just being in her bed going in and out of consciousness like could die but i didn't and now i'm fine so anyway so so jane went after like being in high school, she actually graduated and went to Grimsby College of Art where she studied fashion. So she was really into fashion design and she was considered a very attractive and intelligent woman, right? So this, as she's an adult now, she's like feeling herself. She's in college. She's going to get her fashion degree, whatever that is. And yes, but then like, because I guess she was kind of busting out free and, and enjoying the college life, she had multiple partners, which is okay. That's fine. Like, go on with your badass self. Like, get you some multiple partners, right? Like, it's no shaming. I'm not trying to shame. But she did get pregnant at one point, and she had an abortion. This apparently was said to cause her a lot of mental and emotional trauma, which is understandable. If you are not at peace with the decision you make, you know, that 
under is understandable. And even if you are at peace with having an abortion, it's going to affect you in some way. Um, and you know, I'm not, I'm very, very pro-choice. We're not getting into this. Okay. Anyway, my point is, of course, it's an emotional decision for a woman and, um, it caused her a lot of stress and trauma. Um, unfortunately, uh, a lot of women don't have that experience. I, I'm trying to cover my, cover my ass because I really don't want people saying that I'm pro-life. I mean, anti, anti-choice. I don't know. I'm shutting the fuck up. I'm really going to shut the fuck up before I get down. Um, oh God. Hey, you guys, you just fell. Are you drunk? So she went, um, despite all of it, she graduated. So after the abortion, she graduated, got a job at a dead end job, actually at a Marks and Spencer, um, in Grimsby. And she was a sales assistant. This was obviously a dead end job. Like it's not going to be something that you flourish with. You got your degree. You're feeling good about that position. No, you just went four years to college. You don't want to be a sales assistant. Duh. Duskies. <laughs> so anyways, um, she then saw an anonymous, um, like advertisement in a magazine called the lady magazine, which I've never heard of personally, uh, for a personal dresser. It's okay. One day I'll get it for a personal dresser. And this is a mess, but I don't care. We're all a mess, aren't we? Like, let's just be real. I'm not going to edit this shit. It's going to be pure me being dumb and you guys being drunk and falling over. So cool. So anyways, so this was in 1988 that she answered an anonymous ad in the lady magazine for a personal dresser. She didn't know for who it was, who she would be dressing. Um, and it actually was six months before she got a call back and she finally got a call. And guess who it was? <laughs> it was the Duchess of York, bitch. Yes, the Duchess of York, bitch. And I'm telling you, she was feeling happy about it. So she had an interview, which she passed with flying colors, and began her work in July of 88. 1988, that is. So she went from having absolutely nothing, right? Nothing in her life. Grew up with poverty, and she all of a sudden is around these beautiful things, fine dining, bomb ass clothing, and just high end people, right? And she was enjoying that upgrade girl. She was enjoying the food, the luxury, uh, the luxury accom accommodations. I can't speak sometimes. And for the first time ever, money wasn't a big issue. It was like a pleasure for her. So the Duchess even had a nickname for her. They became close. The Duchess had a nickname for her called Lady Jane. So lady jane so after being employed for just under a year she actually met an ibm executive named christopher dunn butler and he was born in 1946 so he was a little bit older than her i'm talking about that age difference but it didn't matter they were in love yo they were feeling it heart to heart in love don't give a fuck that you're my dad's age oh i'm not age shaming either damn youtube is rough you gotta cover your ass for everything you say anyways <laughs> Probably no one's watching this, so it's okay. So they were in love. There was all this romance to the max. She even had, an, they even like were engaged three months after they met. So they're moving shit quick, right? They're still in that, that part of love where your brain is firing off the feel good chemicals, you know? And you're like, nothing could go wrong. Everything about you I love. Girl, it gets bad though. It gets bad. So they were really rushing things and they married in August of 1990, but things went super fucking downhill. So she was known to have affairs behind his back. And one of those affairs, she met Dimitri Horn and he was a Greek shipping magnate, magnate, I don't really know how to pronounce it, magnate at charity functions. So she left her husband like for this dude. She was like, peace, don't matter, you're old, your ball sag, I'm going to a younger man my age, bitch. Anyways, so she left her husband, moved into a flat that the Duchess gave her. So she's really enjoying life now. And yeah. And finally it, it went bad between her and Dimitri because she's having affairs, right? And she probably would still do that to him, right? So it gets bad later. But first of all, so Christopher, who is her first husband, um, filed 
an infidelity suing process, which is, bitch, you cheated on me. You're a whore. So I'm going to go and I'm going to get a divorce. That kind of rhymed. Bitch, you a whore. I'm going to get a divorce. Right. I'm dumb. Okay. So the Duchess, too, had, like, also was going through a failed marriage. So it kept them, Jane and her, really fucking scissoring. Not scissoring. Really close. I didn't mean to do that. Um, really close and she kept Jane like right by her side and gave her even more responsibilities. Um, so yeah, Dimitri wasn't not working out. Bitch, you left your husband for him. What did you think? It's not going to work out. You cheated. Karma, bitch. <laughs> okay. So sometimes I, I crack myself up, but so Dimitri wasn't working out after he told her it was over. She went absolutely batshit insane and went to his apartment, smashed his shit scratched out all the references of her in his journal and wrote a check from his brother's account. Okay, bitch? She was cray. Little cray cray. She had a record of being so, too. Like, it wasn't just him that sparked the cray in her. It was before that. So, she had one lover who she apparently made death threats and fucked up his car. <laughs> this girl has some issues. So, she called another, um lover to tell him that she was in an abortion clinic and was about to have the operation if he didn't stay with her. Bitch was not even pregnant. Yeah, she pulled that shit. Like, what did you think? He's gonna find out when your stomach doesn't get bigger, you dumb biatch. So I'm sorry, this is disrespectful to her. Anyways, I'm, I don't really like her because she's bad, evil. Or is she... I don't know. We'll see. So she wasn't pregnant and she then overdosed on pills for a second time and again survived just fine. So things got worse though, like went downhill quick. November 1997, she was in her 10th year as the Duchess's dresser. She was randomly out of fucking nowhere to her in her mind. It was out of nowhere, dismissed, like fired. But why? This was super unexpected for her. The Duchess didn't even tell her like, to her face, she sent someone to do it. Like, how fucked up is that? Like, you're not even going to do it to her face. You're going to send someone else to do it. Uh-uh-uh. You're not going to feel bad for her for long, because guess why they fucking let her go? She only made a modest $18,000 a year, yet she was living the high life. I'm talking about expensive London flat. I'm talking about 50000 in the savings account. I'm talking about clothing beyond what you would normally have. Like, this girl was living a lavish, high-end lifestyle, but wasn't making the salary to show that. So, they obviously were like, mm, bitch is stealing. Uh-huh. Bitch is stealing from us. We have to let her go. Right? Duh. <laughs> So it was quoted saying, the palace official was quoted saying, it was never proved legally, but we are convinced she stole a huge amount of money. Bitch. He didn't say a bitch at the end. I did. So she was super fucking depressed. So it was a while before she found another job. She was like, I'm just going to live all this 50 grand I have and I'm not going to work right now. I'm fucking depressed. She was hired by the upmarket London Jewelry from Annabelle Jones, where she worked for the silver department. So she was finally working again. And then in August 1988, she met a well-connected businessman named Tom Cressman. They met through mutual friends. So, and that night they met, he was like, girl, I got to give you a ride home, please. Like, there was this connection. Let me give you a ride home, please. So he talked her into it. And then the next day he actually sent her red roses. Mm -hmm. That's really sweet. Like, right? Like, every girl likes the idea of that. Like, a whirlwind romance where you see someone and you're connected and he talks you into going in his nice car and then he gives you roses the next day. I mean, I would love that. I don't really like flowers, though, because they die. It's not really something that I appreciate very much. But anyways, so it was nice. He sent red roses. It was a sweet, very sweet, loving beginning. And... It ended up that they weren't compatible. So even after the honeymoon phase ended, they were like, bitch, we're not compatible. The 30, so he was 39 and he was a businessman and he loved, I'm talking about loved his bachelor lifestyle, bachelor, bachelor lifestyle. He was all about it. He did not want to get married. No, 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 ho, ho. He didn't want to get married. So he was like, yeah, like I'm not into that. And she was, she wanted that. And 
I'm going to tell you something he was into. This is a trigger warning. <laughs> or not trigger. This is if you're young and watching this, don't. Because I'm about to talk about some sexual graphic stuff. Okay, so <clears throat> this man has some fetishes, which to this day now wouldn't be so weird to me at least. I don't think it's super weird. But then it was a little more taboo. And um, yeah, so he liked anal sex bondage and role play. Now we, there's a whole community for that now, BDSM community, and that's okay. Not shaming sex preferences at all. Like, not at all. But then it was a little taboo, especially because she was not into that shit. Like, at all. She was like, I'm not into it. I do not want to do that. And she was very anti, right? So that immediately is going to cause a rift in the relationship. If you're not sexually connecting, that can cause tension and issues, of course. So they had began fighting and threatened to expose each other. So she was like, I'm going to tell all your businessmen about your sexual fantasies and what you like. And you're going to be embarrassed forever, beach. And he was like... I'm going to go to the tabloids and I'm going to tell them the juice about you and the Duchess and you're, you're going to look like a fool, right? So that was a lot of tension. And Jane would threaten him saying that she like constantly, like I said, and then after they were together for a few months, Jane broke her wrist while she was dancing with him and about, so, okay. So they were dancing, she broke her wrist and unfortunately it, she kind of insinuated that he did it intentionally, right? But still, she went back to his place and healed. Like, he was like, you can come back to my place. And she's like, okay. Like, even though she thought in her mind that he did it purposefully, supposedly. So, yeah. But she was thinking, I'm not just going to stay there while I get healed. I ain't going nowhere, bitch. You will marry me and we're going to have all that shit. And I don't know why, if you're not connected to someone and you're having this turmoil, why would you keep going back? Like, no, you know what? I'm not going to say that because I think that there's a lot of smart, amazing women who are strong that go back to relationships that aren't good um, and it doesn't make them weak. I'm sorry, it just doesn't. So if you think that, fuck you. In the butt. Like he liked. <laughs> okay. So anyways, um... So he had a West London flat. She was staying there. Um, but the relationship came to an end in September 2000. So even though he accepted the idea of marriage finally after she convinced him, evidence honestly suggests otherwise. So we don't really know. Was he finally like, okay, I'll get married? Or was she lying about that? Because he can't be here to defend himself. So anyways, um, they were like children. They were just immature uh very immature as far as like they're threatening each other they're fighting she would always come back to him so jane like okay so early in the month jane and tom went to a boat show in italy and that was followed by a visit to the crestman family villa on the french riviera <laughs> so sometime during this trip tom bluntly said to jane i will never marry you <laughs> like how much clearer what other sign can you have that a man is not the one for you. He said, straight up, girl. You can't be mad. He said it straight up. On the final day, Jane went to the airport, Nike Cote d'Azur. I'm probably butchering that. I'm sorry. With Tom's mom and nephew. So her cell phone combos were overheard. She was loud on her cell phone. She said to her friends that the relationship was done skis. She's like, I'm done with this. I'm done. But still, even, even after saying that, she returned home with Tom. Like, what, girl? So she later claims he changed his mind on the flight back to England. Oh, convenient. Jane, very convenient. And said he would get counseling for his fetishes. Then he changed his mind again the next day, apparently. So he was going back and forth. He's like, yeah, I'll marry you. And I'll, you know, get help for my fetishes. And then the next day he's like, fuck that. Right? We don't really know the truth about that. And this is just what she has said. So Jane said on her testimony that Tom tied her up and anally raped her before telling her to leave. Physical fights went down and during which Tom called the police for help. And I'm going to go ahead and read the transcript for you. So Tom, I'm going to read in a darker, deeper voice. So Tom, I would like someone to stop us hurting each other. If you don't have somebody here soon, somebody is, and then it's cut off. And then the operator, operator's like, right, 
Mr. Cressman? Tom says, yes. Operator, all right, what are you wanting your partner to do? What are you arguing about? Tom, our relationship. Operator, do you not think it would be better you discuss it when you both calm down? Tom, I would love to discuss it calm down. She will not. Operator, do you want her to leave? Tom, yes. Operator, right, what you should do, sir, arrange for her to find suitable accommodation. Tom, I would love to do that. Operator, that's not something the police can provide for you. Tom, no. <laughs> Operator, this is redundant. Operator, that's something you will have to discuss calmly. I will get the police to come and see both of you. All they will do is advise you regarding your behavior. There is nothing specific we can do. We are not marriage guidance service. We deal with crime. Little did she know. Little did that operator know. I hope she feels dumb for like making him feel bad for calling. Like, I hope that's so disrespectful and it made me so mad when I first read that. Anyways, so guess what? No cop showed up. She said a cop would come and talk to them. She never sent a cop. So she thought this was a big joke. I hope she, I really hope that she were like heard about the murder and felt stupid. So anyways, the calls recorded on Jane's phone indicate she left the flat around noon. Although the recipient of most of the calls was Tom. So Jane was calling his parents too, which is, I don't know why. Jane had emailed them copies. Oh my God, this is so petty. This is so fucking petty and horrible. Like, why would you do this? So Jane had emailed his parents copies of sex charged correspondence that Tom had had with a lady named Deborah Demisili. I'm sorry, I butchered that. An American woman he met in Las Vegas when he was like on a business trip a few months earlier. So she, even after this, she still returned to him. Why? Tell me, make it make sense. Why? Why? In her account, the last night they spent together featured attempted anal on his part. Then Tom fell asleep nothing not a big deal and she wasn't sure whether she was half asleep or not when all of a sudden tom starts beating her and he's yelling i'm going to fucking kill you and jane managed to grab a cricket bat and kitchen knife both of which well what both of which she had carried earlier upstairs so these were not items they had upstairs normally earlier she carried them upstairs tell me that is not premeditation motherfucker hell yes it is so anyways And she carried them upstairs earlier. And then, so she lashed back, like defending herself. And the bat struck him on the head. And after he pulled Jane's hair, somehow he then fell on the eight inch knife. You know how you hear like, oh, what? Like when a girl accuses her man of cheating. Oh, what? Did your dick just slip in her vag? Like, this is the same thing. Like what? He just slipped and magically got the eight inch knife into his chest, which he never was able to get out. Like he died. And that's horrible. You know, this is something that could have been avoided. Like, she could have gone her own way multiple times. Because he made it very clear. I'm not what you want. Because I'm not into marriage. I'm not into... I'm into sexual fantasy, BDSM. This is not something that was... I mean, it could have been avoided. It just could have been avoided. So, okay. Her recollection of events was super sketchy from the get-go. Like, as as were the moments that followed. So, she apparently didn't remember showering, but she did after the murder. How long she stayed in the house is kind of unknown before she left. B- but before she left, she actually wrote a little note. And it said, Tom hurt me too much. He was, he was cruel to me. Okay. <laughs> his body was discovered two days later when an employee actually visited his house. She didn't even turn. She let him rot there without any like knowledge, without telling anyone. And he went about her life. And then so in the meantime, Jane's like texting her friends. Um, among those she contacted was the Duchess of York, who actually told her to turn herself in. And then four days after the murder, she was found curled up in the backseat of her white Volkswagen Polo, suffering from her third pill overdose, bitches. Third. So th- this woman obviously has an issue with depression severely to the point where she wants to take her life. Um, but she made it 
pass the, that overdose again. So the judge instructed the jury that they could acquit Jane of the charges if they thought the death was an accident or that she acted in self-defense. Alternatively, I'm reading from the thing. Alternatively, a verdict of manslaughter could be considered if they felt that Jane provoked or suffered from diminished responsibility. The end verdict was this. Are you ready? I'm going to drop the bass. I'm going to drop that beat. Mm, 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 mm. Guilty of murder, bitch. Which I'm glad because I don't believe her. I don't believe her one bit. So on May 16, 2001, the former dresser to the Duchess of York was sentenced to life in prison. She was diagnosed with borderline personality disorder. She escaped, which makes a lot of sense. Um, she, I mean, I, I bipolar. I mean, it's it, it's not as it's more managed now. I think in our our generation. Or our year of 2020. So she escaped prison actually in 2009. Three days later, she was captured in a hotel, which was six miles from the prison. Like, what? Don't go there. Like, go further, Dumbo. Anyways, so she was finally released on license in 2015. Now, if you are like me, you don't know what license means. So I went out of my way and got the definition for you, bitches. So what's license? Being released on license allows the prisoner to reintegrate into the community, rebuild family ties, and helps prevent reoffending. Pretty much she got out. Oh, God. An article stated the following about her. I'm going to end with this. Jane Andrews is extremely manipulative and devious, and she knows exactly what to say and how to convince people to get what she wants. She has managed to wrap all these people around her little finger to get everyone believing it was the right thing to do. She is dangerous. All right, folks, have a mediocre night at best, and I'll be back in a bit with another evil woman. Good night.